The Philosophical Research Society was founded in the 1930s by wisdom scholar Manly P. Hall. I'd like to start tonight's program with a few words from our founder, who was a great fan of the arts. Says Manly, all arts, sciences, philosophies, religions, crafts, and trades can enrich our inner lives to the degree that we realize that through them, the sovereign laws of existence are variously revealed and manifested for our advancement and enlightenment. Manly P. Hall took the arts very seriously. He understood that the arts could reveal to us the laws of existence. He understood that through the doorway of the arts, spiritual information could be transferred. And while Hall took the art seriously, he also perceived that their offer of a reprieve from seriousness was healing. Here are a few more of his words. Quote, with all our learning, let us also remember music, painting, poetry, and all other arts that teach us simply by making us feel better. Mm -hmm. I'm grateful to introduce tonight's speaker, Fahed Siadat, a composer, conductor, and performer. He creates interdisciplinary storytelling works, folding together words, sound, and movement into ritualistic narratives. He's the director of the Resonance Collective, which explores the intersections of artistic and spiritual practice, as well as LA's new music vocal ensemble, Hex. He co-founded the NEO Voice Festival, a week-long celebration of new music for the voice, for which he is the director of composition. He's worked with the Long Beach Opera, the Industry, CalArts Institute Choir, and Columbia University Glee Club. And tonight, he'll speak about his new oratorio, The Conference of the Birds, which will be performed at the Broad Stage in June. And now, please join me in welcoming to the podium, Fahed Siadat. Hello, I'm Fahed. Um, thank you for the lovely introduction. One of the things that you might have noticed in that introduction is that I am not a religious scholar. I am a musician. Um, this is who I am. Uh, as Mandy mentioned, I'm a performer and composer, and the bulk of my work is in interdisciplinary staged works and music for the voice specifically, but I do have a very particular interest in the intersection of creative and spiritual practices, and that was the focus of a lot of my um, doctoral work at the California Institute of the Arts. And that's what the Resonance Collective is about. It's an organization that explores these things, It looks at different uh, definitions of what sacred music is, and what it can be, and how we um, might interact with it. So, this conversation today is focused on the Conference of the Birds, which we'll talk about specifically what that is, and how it relates to not only this new piece that we're premiering, a sort of stage musical version of this giant epic poem, but also how it relates to contemporary thinking in the arts and how Sufi philosophy connects with how many people are engaging with the arts uh, today. So I want to share just a little bit of background information about the piece. The Conference of the Birds is a giant epic poem made of nearly 5,000 rhymed couplets in Masnavi form, which is um, a, a formal sort of poetic tradition uh, in Persian culture. And it was created by Farid Uddin Attar of Naishapur in the 12th century. 
So uh, commonly known as Atar, it was a, a sort of pen name, a nickname that he took on. But um, Atar is also his profession. It means chemist or like alchemist or druggist. Uh, he was essentially like a pharmaceutical dude, but <laughs> less, less sort of sleazy than we might have in the 21st century. <laughs> anyway, um, so yeah, so he was, you know, this, this chemist and he would, you know, he, he was, um, uh, essentially like a local doctor. He, he had a lot of patients, he had a lot of clients, and um, there's some speculation that a lot of them coming to them, to him with their personal problems, as many of us do with our medical professionals, helped inspire and spur on a lot of his philosophical and mystical thinking. Uh, he's written a number of pieces, but the, the one that he's most well known for is the Conference of the Birds which comes from a verse in the Quran about uh, Solomon and David having learned the secret language of the birds, which is the language of the birds or the speech of the birds is maybe a more um, precise translation of the text of the piece. It's the concept of the language of the birds that he's referencing and that is important. This, this old concept in, in certain mystic traditions is referencing a kind of Edenic or perfect divine language that is a secret language spoken by the birds and those who have been initiated into this uh, into this particular language. Um, in addition, uh, another interesting thing about Attar besides his sort of life as an apothecary is that he was a living contemporary with one of the most well-known Sufi poets in America, Rumi. He was acquaintances, sort of, I guess, friendly with Rumi's dad. Um, and there is, uh, he was well known at the time and revered among Rumi and other Islamic and Sufi scholars. Rumi was known to have written that Attar has traveled the seven valleys of love while I am at the bend of the first alleyway. So um, he was a really important person at the time, but his work wasn't really discovered and celebrated for many centuries after he died. A lot of his life is uh, mythologized. And we don't know uh, a great deal of the specifics other than he was an apothecary and that at one point he decided to leave his work as an apothecary and do a great deal of travel studying with many different scholars and mystics and, um, and religious leaders. And that later he was brutally killed during the Mongol invasion in the um, early mid 13th century. There is a great deal of his life that is mythologized and a number of Sufi stories revolve around how he came to the sort of some of the divine understandings um, that he has. One of them is uh, that a wandering Sufi came into his apothecary shop at one point and asked him a question. He said, how will you choose to die? And uh, Attar was like, I don't, I don't know what you're saying. He looked like a homeless person. You get the hell out of my store. Um, and the Sufi goes outside and says, I choose to die now. And he just lays down at the foot of, of his store and passes away. And Attar was so taken by this sort of spiritual control of one person's life that he immediately sort of left everything and started seeking enlightenment and, um, and divine wisdom, and that's why he went into the world. And the story goes that he later chose his own death during this Mongol invasion where he was captured and um, was going to be sold into slavery. And the story goes that when his captor put him on the auction block, he's like, I'm very important. You're not selling me for enough. And so the person's like, you know, I will, oh, okay, well, I'll double the price. And someone offers double the price because it's really, it's still not enough. It's not enough. You need to, you need to ask for more. And he keeps on driving up the price until one of the people, one, one of this guy that's wondering why is like, well, I've got like a bag of grain. Will that do for this guy? And he's like, that's, that's my worth. You should sell it for that. And the Mongol got so upset that he, he uh, cut his head off right then and there. And that was sort of like a, his way of choosing his, his death. Um, but there's a lot of stories about about Attar in this in this sort of in this sort of method. So, um, as I was saying, his most well-known book and what we're talking about today is the Conference of the Birds, and I'll give you a little overview of the story. The story begins with the birds of the world gathering in search of their sovereign. The hoopoe 
This, uh, the hoopoe is, uh, I don't know if you can see the picture, it's a little bit faded, but this is very strange looking bird with this extremely awesome crown of feathers that protrudes from their head. And the hoopoe steps forward from the group of the birds and says, I know who our sovereign is. Sovereign is the sea moor, which is this divine, mythical beast. He lives on Mount Kof, which is um, a magical mountain that circumvents the entire world and is also very difficult to find, even though it circumvents the entire world. Um, and the hoopo comes from, it enters into the story because of an, old, or sto an older story with Solomon. The, the hoopo is an integral character in helping Solomon in um, some of the stories that involve Solomon and uh, Sheba, Queen of Sheba, and acts as a sort of intermediary for them, and so, uh, and I think it partly like teaches Solomon the language of the birds, so they have this special connection, and the hoopo is given this divine um, understanding about how to find the sea morgue. And what the hoopo says is that there are seven valleys that you have to work through to find, to find the sea morgue. And the birds of the world are like, okay, that sounds like a really long and very difficult journey. I don't think it's for me. Uh, and they come up with all these excuses, all these different excuses for why they shouldn't have to go on this journey, why they already have the understandings that are needed. Maybe we don't actually need a sovereign. Maybe, uh, maybe this is, you know, like, I've, I've got these understandings. I am already understanding love. I am already understanding these things, or for whatever reason. And the hoopo uses stories to teach them why, basically, why they're wrong, and that they need to live a real, true, divinely inspired life and go on this spiritual journey. One of the lines that stands out to me is, if you can find your way to the ocean, why rush toward a drop of dew? <laughs> right? So, one by one, the birds are eventually convinced to go on this journey. And they journey through the seven valleys, which is, an outline of the Sufi spiritual path. It is the Valley of the Quest, which is the beginning of the journey, the, the Valley of Love, which is probably where most people on the spiritual path get stuck, <laughs> thinking that that's enough. There's the Valley of Knowledge, the Valley of Detachment, Unity, Wonderment, and finally, a phrase that translates very poorly into English, Poverty and Annihilation. The, the Persian phrase is fekra fena, and fena is a sort of dissolution of the self into the divine stuff. <laughs> um, yeah, let's we'll get into that a little bit more of the valleys. Um, but of the one hundred thousand birds that go on this journey, at the end, only thirty arrive at the gates of the sea morgue, and. We'll have a little spoiler alert later, and I'll tell you what happens. Um, it's, it's, I think it's worth it to, to talk a, a little bit about it. So I'm going to take the Conference of the Birds, and I'm going to pause there for a second, and I want to talk about Sufism more generally. Uh, my assumption is that many people here are here attending this talk because you already are familiar to some degree with Sufism, maybe uh, to a, a, a very large degree. It's been um, a deep interest of mine since I was a teenager, and it's, and it's been a, a focus of a lot of my study, um, and also a lot of my artistic work uh, through, actually, sort of a funny thing, through my doctoral research and, and work, I actually officially became part of a Sufi house for the first time. And it's the closest I've ever come to really joining um, a religion. So this is, this is a new experience for me to actually talk about these things out loud. This has been a lifelong part of, of who I am, but not something that I've often shared with the public. It's definitely been like a secret part of my work, and, and with pieces like this and other works that I've been starting to create that are um, around the Conference of the Birds, I'm only now beginning to more overtly connect my own sort of personal spiritual beliefs with my artistic practice. And um, I don't know, I feel like there's a lot of artists that, that might find themselves in similar situations or similar positions. I think Los Angeles is a city full of people who are spiritual but not religious, <laughs> you know? And we're sort of, um, I think that is not unrelated to why we are also a city of artists, right? And why this place seems to attract uh, creative people. I think there's something about 
how we engage with the arts that seems to scratch that itch. And it provides something that, um, that we get from religion that we don't always get from being spiritual but not religious, religious, which is a disciplined practice. This idea of a dedicated, disciplined practice as a way of moving forward on some sort of path is an integral part of being a religious person and also an integral part of being an artist. So most recently I've been saying that it's not that I'm spiritual but not religious, I'm just I'm religious but not dogmatic, if that makes sense. Um, I did grow up Muslim, that's, that's, that's sort of my um, culture and uh, cultural and religious background, but um, you know, growing into my adulthood, I've taken a sort of larger and ecumenical approach, and that's what's brought me to, to Sufism. So Sufi, Sufi philosophy and Sufism in general is a sort of funny and amorphous thing. It's, it defies easy... Uh, definition. There's no clear origin to Sufism. Uh, it very clearly shows certain roots with, or shares certain roots with other kinds of philosophies. So Erastrianism, which of course was the um, pre-Islamic religion in Iran, as well as different branches of Buddhism, particularly Mahayana Buddhism. But there's not any kind of specific starting point to Sufism. I once asked a, a friend of mine, well, where do you think, like, Sufi philosophy and everything come, came from. <coughs> Excuse me. And he said something that I'm never going to forget. He said, the first time a person fell in love with the divine, that was the beginning of Sufism. And everything from there is an expression of it. It is a trapping of it. Um, Sufism is often described as the mystical branch of Islam. And I think that is... Uh, Kind of true. I mean, for I think for, for many Muslims, it is. Um, I think it's analogous to how Kabbalah is related to Judaism. It sort of is a part of Judaism and also isn't, or the way that like the threefold path is to Christianity. Um, it has the trappings of Christianity, but at the heart, there is something else. My own personal uh, kind of interpretation is that Sufi philosophy is the core of what Islam is. We'll talk about this a little bit more, but this it is a philosophy of removing one's own ego. And the five pillars of Islam are all ways of practicing that to different degrees, right? There's like the valley of the quest, the beginning of a journey, the initial statement that you believe in the la ilaha illallah, as they say, as I believe in um, no god but God, or not infinite, if not God. It's like another really great translation of that. Um, there's like the giving of alms, there's the going on a pilgrimage, there's the daily prayers, there's fasting. There's all these different ways that we find a way to sort of negate our sense of individual self and give ourselves up to something that's greater. And that for me is the center of what Islam is and also the heart of Sufi practice. Um, but there are many Sufi groups that do not uh, approach their practice as part of Islam and, and clearly identify separately from Islamic practice. Um, this is especially true for many, for many Persians, especially many Persians in the States. I think it's partly political because there's so much fraught energy between, um, you know, just uh, the, with the Islamic revolution in the 70s and that sort of the, that, that push-pull tension with Persians and Islam. And of course, also, because there is so much religious history that is pre-Islamic, right? And Sufi philosophy, a lot of that predates Islam, that there is, for many people, like an intentional separating of the two. Um, but that being said, many of the um, images and references and the poems and stories are often related directly to Islam because of the sort of um, geographic and cultural place where much of Suf Sufism occurs. So, um, yeah, like, like all spiritual practices, you know, Sufi, Sufism is, is based in a sort of mystical philosophy. And I think this is where language starts to break down. I don't know how you talk about mystical philosophy. Um, I remember my friend was reading this book on, on Zen one time, and he put it down and he said, there's only so long I can read a book that tells me I can't learn this from a book, <laughs> right? So um, <laughs> there, is, there is something about trying to engage in discussing what mysticism is 
and even just the word, it eventually begins to lose its sort of its sort of meaning. Um, and it's very easy to sort of get trapped into the dogma, the rules, the, the, the specific um, ideas or very specific practices and lose that central jewel that is driving the entire practice forward. So it, as long ago as the 10th century, a, um, a Sufi philosopher once said that today Sufism is a name without a reality, but it once was a reality without a name. Uh, a lot of Sufis talk about how pens break when you try to write this down. Or, or how when you're trying to describe the ineffable, it takes an infinite amount of language to try and describe something that was beyond words in the first place. So, so since this just feels like a really futile exercise to try to talk about. So I, I'm, I'm kind of not going to engage. I'm, I'm not going to try to go too deeply into what Sufi philosophy is. Um, except for to say, again, that it is a practice of letting go of the ego, which, again, is this, like, giant phrase that means nothing. Um, but I think it, it can be helpful to understand the process by looking at the Conference of the Birds and these seven, these seven valleys. Um, and, and again, this is something that I've been sort of learning bit by bit by spending time with this piece, by, with, with this book and with the musical piece that we've created around it. Because we're spending hours with it, you know, every week, rehearsing it, talking about it, working it through, experiencing the story. And because of that, you know, I, I've been getting through those discussions, we get little glimpses of what this is. So the Valley of the Quest is, is very similar to that, um, as I was saying, like to the la ilaha illallah, this initial declaration of a belief and desire to engage with and seek the truth. And then there's the valley of love. And the valley of love, as I was saying, is, is where I think most people get stuck, right? Like, well, isn't this what we're talking about? Like the divine and God is love and we are love and, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And um, it's actually that the nightingale comes out and, and says this whole thing about love and, oh, but I have love and I love love already. And, and it's such a tricky thing, but that's the problem, right? It's to love love is to miss the thing behind the thing, right? So when someone gives you a gift, don't look at the gift, look at the giver. Um, so this valley is this like, once you begin that journey, it, you open up to a whole world of emotional experiences. And if you move past that, you move to the valley of knowledge or the valley of understanding, or maybe a better word would be uh, gnosis, right? This sort of very different sort of um, experiential understanding. And once you move through that is the valley of detachment, which I think has a lot of strong Buddhist flavor to it, right? This idea of, um, what they say is, let go of both this world and the next. Don't worry about earth. Don't worry about heaven. Let go of both of them if you are looking for the divine. The, the divine is the beloved, is beyond both of those things, and is both. It is larger than those things, and our desire for one or the other. And then there's the Valley of Unity, which you would think would be the last one, right? There it is, Unity. There, I've done it. Myself, I, you, me, us, we, none of it exists. We're all one. And when you get through there is the Valley of Wonderment. I don't know how you describe wonderment. The Valley of Wonderment. And after that is the final step. The valley, of, uh, the valley of spiritual poverty and annihilation, or the valley of death, maybe. But it's not body death. It's complete and total absence of I, or you, or we, or us. These are ideas. These are ideas. But um, s mystical philosophy, Sufi philosophy, is not about ideas. It's about experience. It's about... Um, or, uh, Embodiment? <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, it's, it, it, again, you, you can't read it in the book, right? And, um, well, we'll talk a little bit about this, but the, um, 
What happens after they get through these seven valleys, they arrive at the gates of the sea morgue and they are turned away. The, these 30 bedraggled, torn, molting birds, a herald comes out and says like, who are you? <laughs> you don't, the sea morgue doesn't care about you. And it's that, it's that final turning away where they even let go of their desire to find and experience divinity, that they finally fully let go and the gates open and they enter. And there's nothing there. That's the climax of the story. There's nothing there. And they look at each other and they see see more. In, in Farsi, C means 30, Morg means birds. I um, become very emotional every time I talk about the story. It was, a, it was a story I grew up with, um, my father would tell it to me all the time. But there is something about that turn, those 30 birds. 100,000 start, 30 arrive. And it was there at the very beginning. We're looking for C. Morg. Uh, there's a line in, in the uh, book where it says, if you had come as 40 or 50, C. Morg would have been 40 or 50 birds. You, you came to find yourself. This is one of those moments where the difference between intellectual understanding, okay, yes, I understand you are God, and I am God, and we're all one, and we're all divine, that's great. But it means nothing until you can go through this entire journey and these valleys and have that experience of finally letting go. And so um, that final moment is what in Sufi philosophy is not just fana, that annihilation of the self. There's another half to it, which is, um, I'm sorry, I don't speak Farsi or Arabic. Um, but uh, it's, I think it's called Baka, or Baka, which is the opposite of Fena. So Fena is the ocean taking in a drop, right? The drop dissolving into the ocean, maybe retaining some of its dropness, but becoming part of the great, the great sea. But the reverse is the entire ocean coming together to court a single drop of water. It's the divinity of that drop and the divinity of the ocean being equal to oneself. One is the rising sun and the glory of the rising sun. And one is the dissolution of the setting sun. And a lot of the Sufi path is going and experiencing back and forth one to the other. The sort of like the bodhisattva moment would be another way of describing back off. But this like the cyclical nature of, of um, forgiveness and gratitude, right? One is the dissolution of oneself, gratitude, just letting go. And one is the ability to be large and offer forgiveness for something. And these things circle on each other, not in a circle, but in a spiral until they become overlapping and the same while maintaining their individual separateness. That's, that's the um, sort of irrational paradox of what is described in, in The Comforts of the Birds and what is um, hoped for in the Sufi path. So, that's a lot. <laughs> um, that's, my best, that's, that's, that's my best at trying to describe Sufi philosophy. Um, what I want to talk about is how we can move towards that through the arts and what the arts are in terms of a spiritual practice and what they've always been in Sufi philosophy. Um, there was one thinker, philosopher in particular, called Ibn Arabi, who had an idea that he called the creative imagination. Um, this is a lot of this is described in Henry Corbin's book um, called Ibn Arabi, or Sufism, the Sufism of Ibn Arabi and the Great Imagination. Um, and uh, it, Henry Corbin was a um, was like a French philosopher and 
mystic scholar in the early 20th century from France. It was like part of the, what's the term? He was an Orientalist, was one of my, my faves. Um, it was part of, you know, like a whole cultural vibe at the time where East and West were sort of starting to come together and there was a lot of interest and because of, um, you know, France's location in the Mediterranean and nearness to the, um, to the Middle East, a, a lot of um, ideas were getting kind of put back and forth. And so he, he got really deeply into this stuff. And, and Ibn, Arabi, uh, Ibn Arabi talks about how our creative imagination is a way of accessing divine understanding of things, that our imagination at its best is actually, you know, as artists, we are channeling something. We are not necessarily creating something. It's our ego that gets in the way, but when we're able to let go and remove our ego as an obstacle to some degree or another, then we become um, an aperture, and the aperture opens, and something flows through. And there's a, a key concept that he talks about, which is the idea of symbols. And symbols as opposed to metaphor, right? Metaphor being a different way of understanding a thing, right? You hold a rock, maybe like a, you know, a dense piece of carbon or something, right? And a metaphor is a way to look at it from this angle. And another metaphor is a way of looking at it from this angle, right? So you can fully understand this thing. But a symbol is a way of elevating our consciousness and our understanding to new things entirely. This probably isn't a new concept. This is, I'm pretty sure, what the entire Philosophical Research Society is um, based on, right? Like, there's like a giant book in the bookstore that's all about like Manly Hall doing simple stuff and talking about how important they are. So, so this idea of how a symbol can like um, help us access something that is abstract is uh, that ineffable thing that would take an infinite amount of language to describe in the first place, or to um, something that is maybe like we would look at as irrational, right? To be able to expand our minds, to encompass things that we would, weren't able to previously understand. There's a, a really great Sufi story about uh, the Prophet Muhammad talking with the angel Gabriel, as he does. You know, they're just kind of hanging out, and having lunch, or whatever, and, um, and Muhammad says, you know, I would love to see you, I would love to see what you look like, like actually look like, not like the sort of, you know, presentation you put forth. And Gabriel was like, it's too much, bro. Trust me. And he was like, no, I'm like, I'm a prophet of God. I'm the prophet Muhammad. Like, I can, I can handle it. And Gabriel shows him a feather, just a single feather from one of his wings, which stretches across the sky, mountaintop to mountaintop. And Muhammad, of course, his mind breaks. He becomes just a huddling, gibbering mass. And Gabriel holds him. It's, like, it's not for you to understand. The human mind is this. You're, you, we cannot access the infinite in this way. And the way that we can touch it is through symbols, right? It's a way for us to, again, to elevate our consciousness and to bring a new kind of understanding. So the arts, actually, it was Mandy, it was what you said, the, 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 whole, the whole Manly Hall quote. Like, he actually, I, I don't, I just, open up his books and read them, um, because he's, he, said it, he said it really clearly. The arts are a way for us to understand the true nature of reality. And they're, they're a way for us to access greater and greater understandings beyond our current understandings. We might not be able to put those into words, right? But the experience of it, for a moment we get to touch something through the arts. So this idea has become pretty, um, well, actually, I guess not, not too long after Henry Corbin was doing his writing, um, that East meets West idea started making its way into the United States also. I'm, I'm again, a musician, the classical, Western classical tradition. So um, I'm mostly familiar with the people who were in that world that started bringing these ideas over. But two people in particular in the 50s and 60s, John Cage and Pauline Oliveris a little later, were pioneers in integrating Eastern philosophy into Western music. Uh, a lot of these things <clears throat> had aesthetic consequences, right? Um, you know, the, the musical minimalism came out of looking at um, different 
philosophical and aesthetic choices that come from Buddhism from, and also from Southeast Asian musical traditions like gamelan and things like that. But there was something else that was happening that ended up tying the music of this time, and actually and still the music of today, more closely to some of these spiritual practices that come from the Middle East and from, and from Southeast Asia. East Asia in general, which is, um, it had, and I guess we saw this in like the in painting and in the other art forms too, but it had artists of the time just completely reevaluate fundamental questions about the arts. What is art? Um, I feel like that's, I don't know, that's like a very, very school question. Um, but I think it becomes a lot more interesting when you start asking yourself what isn't art, right? And uh, I always do this with music, like, okay, so what makes a thing music? Like, what is the opposite of music? Would it be noise? Okay, great, so what makes noise versus music? Okay, well, music has to have, like, a, a melody. Okay, um, well, if I hear, like, a beautiful drone, right, like, if I hear, like, a sitar playing, there's no melody, it's just a sort of beautiful drone. It's, that seems like music to me. Okay, well, maybe maybe music then has to have like tones. But when I hear like a drum core, and there's no tones. It's just all percussion. It still feels like music. Uh, one of my favorite definitions was that music is sound organized in time. That seems pretty open. But organized by whom? That was that's, that gets trickier. Is bird song music? Right, it's like an alien harp, it's like the wind through the trees that makes like whistling sounds, is that music? And what happens is you start to ask this question is it begins to look very similar to another question that people are asking, which is what is sacred? What is not sacred? How do you define what is sacred? And we start to realize that we actually treat the two the same, right? We walk into a concert hall and we treat it like a church certain ways you dress, there are certain kinds of decorum. If I take a, a blank piece of paper, I have no problem putting a match to it. But if suddenly there's words on it, they're printed, if we call it a book. Uh, burning a book, it's like morally problematic, right? It's still just a piece of paper. Okay, what if it's not a book? What if it's just a piece of paper and I draw a Star of David on it? Would a Jewish person feel comfortable burning that? Probably not. I once I was once was having this conversation with a composition professor of mine. We were talking about symbols, and I remember I drew a star of David on his whiteboard. And he goes, "I can't erase that. That's there forever now." <laughs> <laughs> this idea that we can imbue things with sacredness that maybe sacredness and art are what we decide they are. And I know that that, that can sound like a cop-out, but I think there's actually something really wonderful about it, right? I think it's, it starts to look like Sufi philosophy, which is that here there is a truth, there is the sun, and in between that and us are a thousand veils, and the spiritual path is removing one veil at a time getting closer and closer to that true understanding. I am you, you are me, we are God. All these nice ideas, right? This is noise, no, this is music, this is music, this is art, everything is art. What if I put a frame around this? It's suddenly it's art. What if everything is art? What if everything is sacred? How do we get there? Well, it's by deciding that it is, right? And so these artists, Jeff Cage, Pauline Oliveros, also like Duchamp, right? Like, I mean, all these abstract expressionists, this idea that you can start to put a frame around everything and it suddenly elevates it. How do we elevate everything? And how does that also elevate ourselves? How do we turn everything into a symbol that helps us access that higher understanding, that elevated consciousness? And can we turn that into an artistic practice? One that gets us out of the way, opens the aperture, right? Instead of saying like, I am creating this thing um, with these intentions and all this kind of stuff, what happens if we start engaging in, in deep listening and just trying to listen to a thing as it is without any of that internal chatter distracting us from it? That's very good. 
all right? And it's also extremely Sufi, this idea of wanting to access the ultimate truth and the thing that's in the way is us, right? So, so this idea of, um, of artistic practice becoming spiritual practice ends up just being uh, a choice, right? Just something that we can sort of step into and um, just to relate it back to what I was saying earlier when um, during the introductions, that's kind of what the Resonance Collective is, right? It's, it's an exploration of, of sacred music, but with the sort of intellectual understanding that it's all sacred. Now it's a practice. We come together, we have concerts, we, we create new work, we have group experiences where we try to practice experiencing a thing as sacred, where we become aware of the thing itself and of our own inner dialogue, our own inner chatter that gets us in the way of experiencing the thing itself. It is a way of practicing that other kind of divine understanding by approaching art in that way. So I thought um, we could try it. I mean, lectures are boring, but art and singing is fun, so we're going to sing. So, <clears throat> this is uh, a listening and singing practice. I'm going to ask big things of you. <clears throat> I'm going to ask that, uh, I'm going to start playing this sound file. It's just a drone, it's this little harmonic drone, it's all voices, <clears throat> and there's only four notes that are being sung. Right? Uh, in a few different octaves, people are singing. Uh, just, they're, they're, they'll sing a note, and then they kind of take a breath, and they sing another note. You're going to hear the swimmy harmonic drum. Okay? And uh, I'm going to ask you to do two things. One is to listen, just to listen to it, and, and pay attention not only to the sound itself, but also to your thoughts about the sound that you're hearing. Right? Your thoughts about it, your moralizing, your judgment, your judging. Oh, this is so cool. Yeah, that's your ego speaking, right? That is, that is us moralizing and, and putting ourselves on the thing instead of just listening to the actual thing itself. This is so boring. Why am I doing this? I'm such a bad singer. Why is he asking me to sing? This is so embarrassing. Those are all those things that are inner chatter. So I'm going to ask that you listen and you put that stuff aside. And then, as the spirit moves you, you take a breath and you sort of join. Let's see what happens. <laughs>
open your mouth and say? It's <laughs> <laughs> calling you up. This is more than belly. <laughs> yeah, this is, you know, again, to talk about to talk about these ideas without experiencing a little bit of it, right? And, 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 not, and not to say to experience divine understanding, to experience the struggle of what it means to be on that path in the first place, right? To see what it's like to fight and resist your own ego, right? And to, to wrestle with these sorts of, with, with these sorts of um, expectations that we might have of ourselves. Um, that's what these, like, these sorts of sonic meditations are about, right? They're about... Um, getting past those things and getting towards the thing itself. Um, and it, you don't do it after like four minutes of listening to a drum and it's practice, right? We're not good at it. Um, but this is, this is sort of like what, what this is about. And this sort of idea, again, is, is how, um, at least from my own work as an artist, I am looking at finding ways to infuse and work with music as as a spiritual practice so um, yeah it's most of what I, what I wanted to share with you um, I thought we could have some questions and then um, if if you want to chat a little bit about it I can share with you um, some information about the show that we're doing next month and I have a sample if there's time if you're curious so yeah, thanks for coming. Again, I'm totally 100% not a religious scholar, so if you have deep and interesting questions about Sufism, I will not be able to answer them. Um, but if you have questions about art, I can probably help you out. Um, but otherwise, I would love to hear just your experience of what that exercise was and any other questions you might have about um, things that I want to refer to as a question. I have a question. You mentioned you got interested in Sufism when you were a teenager. Was there something in particular that sort of brought you into that path? Oh uh, yeah, it was a weird story. Um, my parents are divorced and live on opposite sides of the country. And for my 15th birthday, 16th birthday, they got me the exact same thing uh, for my for my birthday. They both got me a copy of Coleman Barks' translation of The Essential Rumi and Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. <laughs> and as far as I'm concerned, those are the same book. <laughs> yeah, and I was like, this is a thing. Like, this is, this doesn't just happen, right? Like, so when, um, when fate comes screaming at your door, you should pay attention. And so I just, those two books you know, became um, the beginning of something. And, um, you know, and, and then I, I later, like, I connected it with the story of the Conference of the Birds. And again, it was a story my father told me when I was a kid. Um, I didn't, he didn't use the word Seymour, I didn't understand what a Seymour was. He was like, oh, the birds are after the, the phoenix. That was something I understood Greek mythology, yeah, the phoenix, you know, so that I started making those those connections, but um, but yeah, that was that was what what spurred it on, and um, and then I think it was around that same time that I went to Mecca, and uh, that is a hell of an experience. <laughs> yeah, um, it wasn't during Hajj because I didn't want to be trampled to death um, when I was like fifteen, um, but uh, it was during what's called Umbra, which is the off season, um, and it's just there's uh, there's nothing like being around that sort of concentrated focus on one object, just thousands of people. And also just the, the history of it, right? Like there's a, the big square and inside it's like the rock that people sort of circumnam circumambulate around. Um, and a corner of it's exposed, right? So as you're making your seven concentric circles around the Kaaba, there's a, um, a corner of it that's open to this rock and then people go and like they touch it or they kiss it. And it is smooth as glass and concave from people just doing like this over 2,000 years. And it was just a wild experience to think, um, every person in my family has done this. You know, well not maybe not every person in my family, neither of my parents have. Um, but you know, that people, every, like in, in my family's history, like this has been a tradition for us forever. And, um, and then to be a part of that, I don't know, it was such a, um, an overwhelming experience. I was so small. You know, that is like a, a hint of that ego dissolution thing we were talking about. Um, that that I think, I don't know, you, you kind of 
you smell it, and then you have to go and find the bakery. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, can I ask what you do? You think that there's a difference between the language of birds and like uh, the human, like human languages, or how do you conceive of that? Oh. Um, I think it's okay, I mean, I think it's a metaphor for for like this idea of Edenic language, right? So like Edenic language is an idea that there is um, a language of perfect communication, uh, a language without rhetoric, right? So one of my favorite interpretations of the Eden story is that the fall is the introduction of rhetoric into um, the human mind, right? It's, it's the introduction uh, to lies, it's the first deception. Like rhetoric is the ability to say one thing and mean another, right? And um, I think this idea of a divine language is one that communicates perfectly. And I think it's related to this idea of symbols, right? That that through symbols, that that I really I really resist the idea that music is a um, a language, um, because if music, I mean, if it's a language, it is as culturally specific as any language is. Um, but that being said, I do think that there is a way for art and music and symbols to help us access a greater shared understanding between people. And, um, and so that's, that's kind of what I hear in that idea of the language of the birds, is that birds are communicating in music in a sort of like a Edenic, Edenic way. But I don't, I, I mean, I don't take this literal truth. Maybe, I mean, birds are smart. Oh. Yes. <laughs> So when I'm working with symbols as an artist, I'm usually working with like images, either through visual art or through written language, like poetry. I'm wondering how symbolic language translates in music and through sound, because it's just such like an image-based thing for me. Yeah, so interesting. I mean, you know, I, I think one of the one of the funny things about being a musician that works with words a lot, right, is um, finding the right words. Mm. Right? So, like, for instance, Rumi's poetry, which I love deeply and, you know, like, have rooms of it memorized and I read it every year, like, during Ramadan, that's my Ramadan practice. Um, like, I'm, I won't set it to music. It doesn't need it. You know? It's, it's good. Right? Um, one of the most recent things that I set to music was, um, uh, it was notes from a religious class that I a theology class that I found in a church classroom. And I just took pictures of the whiteboard and I was like, this is awesome, yeah. I don't know what any of this means, it means nothing. It was just totally abstracted. And so, you know, for something like that, what, what I feel like music can do is add another dimension to it. Or like what dance can do is add another layer of understanding to it. So it's not, I don't think it's clarifying it, I think it's adding abstraction on abstraction. It's adding a symbol on a symbol to create maybe a third meaning. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of what I'm shooting for. Yeah. Oh, okay, I said stuff and the hands went up. Please, go ahead. <laughs> How do you reconcile uh, granting credit and acclaim with the dissolution of ego in the arts? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah. You know, one of the, one of the, um, one of the, the funny things that I remember encountering when I joined the, the Sufi house was, um, was there was this particular tradition, which is the Namatullahi order, um, their particular resistance to um, aesthetic, uh, not aesthetically living, um, what's the word we're looking for, but like monkish, not that I right either, but like this idea of like don't, like, they're like don't, don't live in poverty, don't live on the mountain, don't be separate from the world, be in the world. And that's the trick, right? It's easy to be enlightened up there, it's hard to be like enlightened when you're like with the stinking masses. Um, and and I think there's, you know, like it's just, some of it's just practical, right? Like, like getting, um, getting credit for my work is how I get paid, which is how I eat, which is how I create more work. You know what I'm saying? The trick is, and I'm not saying that I've accomplished this trick, but the trick is about attachment to it. Mm -hmm. Right? So, can you, uh, this is very like Osho, you know, Osho, Bhagwan, uh, right? And it's like, oh yeah, you can have a Rolls Royce and millions of dollars and dozens of women or whatever, just don't be attached to it, right? So, I mean, I think it's a very tall order, but I think that's, that's the trick is looking at, um, at the art as a service and as an offering. And not, I mean, to us, to people, but also 
an offering, you know? Um, and yeah, I mean, many, many Sufi poets, that was a part of the practice was not to give themselves credit. In fact, they would usually give credits to their teachers, um, right? The, uh, it's, it's, a, it's like a thing in um, a lot of Sufi poetry that in the last written cuff, couplet of in the Masnavi form is how you, you credit yourself. You put your name somehow in it. And like Rumi, for instance, used to always put um, not always, but often would put Shams, his teacher, in it. And if you read Coleman Barks' translations, he's very fast and loose with this. It's funny because um, sometimes he mentions Shams specifically, but in Arabic, the word Shams means the sun. So sometimes you'll just notice in a lot of the poetry, it ends with a reference to the sun. And it's him giving his teacher credit. It's that idea of being the aperture, right? And letting it flow through. Um, Rumi wasn't uh, making money and living off of his poems, so that's you know, a different issue. Um, but yeah, I think I, I, it, I think it has to do. I think your question has to do with attachment. I hope that was satisfying. Next, yes. As we were listening to the music, you wanted to know our feedback. I um, I just somehow imagine us being in the form of like a church like right mm -hmm. so we're sharing um this experience together and um wondering like what do you think maybe art could be a form of religion that brings people together and you know form of transcension and um i uh my question is do you also do you feel that um, what is your opinion as far as do you think Attar was wrote uh, the um, uh, poem as a piece of art, or was it philosophy, or what? Like, what is your opinion? It's a great question. Um, to answer your first question, yes. Art is, has always been my religion, and it just took me a long time to realize that. Um, but again, when I say religion, I mean a disciplined practice that moves us down a spiritual path. Yes. That's what I mean by that. And I think that's true for a lot of people, and I think a lot of us just don't want to admit it. Um, and that's, that's why we started the Residence Collective. Residence Collective was created to build a space for people who are hungry for that experience who are hungry um, for the opportunity to make their art and spiritual practice overtly the same, right? Because there are too many, especially I see this a lot in the, um, in the music world, there are all, a lot of composers who clearly their stuff is like so, so deeply influenced by like wildly mystical thought. And then you ask them about it, and they're like, oh, you know, it's just, uh, it's, I mean, there's this George Crumb composer who wrote this piece called like Star Child the macrocosmos, which is a whole set of pieces based on the zodiac. And they have these wild scores that are all circular and like graphic oriented. And I, and I remember asking him about it once. And I was like, what's up with the, the circular scores, dude? And he's like, well, you know, I was having coffee and my coffee can was on the table and I drew a circle around it, you know? And I was like, you're not giving up the goods, <laughs> you know? Like, and he wouldn't, he wouldn't give up the goods. Um, because, I think because there is, maybe it has to do with the, um, the, the sort of like cultural tie between the arts and liberalism and the sort of anti-religious push for a lot of in a lot of liberal circles that make people hesitant, mm -hmm. right, um, to embrace the arts as, as religious practice. But I'm just so much happier when I acknowledge that it's true for me. And I think, um, you know, that's, I'm trying to create a space where people are welcome to have that, that moment also. Um, I know nothing about Atar. I wish I did. Uh, I, the only thing I can say about his intention my, my idea behind his intention is that clearly the Conference of the Birds contains a number of teaching stories, right? It's one of those nested parables, very much like the, um, the Thousand and One Nights, that was like a, a medieval form in Islamic and, and Persian literature. Um, but all of the parables in it, and like so many Sufi stories, are very much teaching stories. So I think there is some level of, um, and also a lot of them aren't even original. It was like um, amassing stories that were just in the culture at the time from different Sufi teachers. And then some of them were, I think, were original, of course. Um, but so I, I think there, in, within that is there's a lot of wisdom that can be learned from. And I, I assume that was at least part of the intent. Yeah. Yeah, yes please. I have two related, maybe three related questions. One is, um, 
do you do you consider art revelation in your opinion? Oh, uh, can you say more about that? I feel like that's like a whole like lecture. Like, we talk about, about spirituality art and sp the spiritual connection between art. And, you know, I mean, so we so there are certain uh, you know later offshoots of Sufism that that consider some of the the poetry to be actual revelation, like God speaking through a poem uh, to us. You know. Um, do you do you feel that when you make art, and um, what is your process to take the conference of the birds and make it into your art, and then can you reveal some of your art to us? <laughs> yes, all those things. Um, yeah, I, I think at its I think at its best it's that channeling, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think I think at its best, and I think it takes practice to get there. Um, more and more of my work has embraced uh, improvisation as part of its practice because of that experience and that like the, you know, that flow state, mm -hmm. the 21st century like tech company version <laughs> of divine revelation for <laughs> like the flow state. Um, so uh, yeah, I think it, I think it can be. You know, um, I'm <laughs> I'm friends with with uh, with Michael Squaff, the guy who wrote the theme song to Friends. And, um, and he actually gave me this image of the aperture opening, this idea. And he actually, he said there's, there was two times in his life where he felt like that aperture fully opened and art poured through him. And one of them was the creation of the French theme song. <laughs> <laughs> so, there you have it. Um, but I think it's totally... The aperture. Yeah, yeah. But I think, I think that's totally a thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he also did the, the soundtrack for, to Grace and Frankie, um, which also has a lot of claps. You might notice now you can there's like a aesthetic connection. Um, anyway, uh, I am distracted myself with <laughs> So how do you go from the Conference of the Birds to a piece, a composition? Right. Yeah, great question. Um, so there's a funny story about how I encountered, so, so first off, I was singing in this group, there's this other person singing in this group, she heard a piece of mine and she was like, oh, I love to commission pieces based on mystical texts, you should do the Conference of the Birds, I've always wanted to do it. <laughs> and I was like, okay, <laughs> I've always wanted to do it too, and I didn't realize it was this massive story. And so I started looking around online, finding public domain texts because you have to give credit to the and, and permission from like poets and writers and translators and all this other kind of stuff. And um, I was like, oh, maybe I can get my dad to help me. Like my dad, like you know, he's Persian, he speaks Farsi. I don't speak Farsi. He could help me. And that and it's like it's so difficult to translate Sufi poetry. It's like impossible. And I'm at the last bookstore, and I'm, and I'm going into the Sufi section to look at Conference of the Birds books. And, uh, and there was, they're all, you know, spines out. And then one of them was cover up. And I was like, oh, I've never, I haven't seen this one. So I pick it up, I open it up. Oh, it was just published a few months ago. Okay, that's why I haven't heard of this one yet. Oh, the translator lives in Los Angeles. So I just Google her and I send her a message and I'm like, Shole, I'm a composer, I'm doing these things, here's some samples of my music. She's like, come to my house and we'll have tea and we'll talk about it. She lived walking distance. Okay, so I go over there, we become immediately besties, and she's like, you cannot use my book to make Conference of the Birds, I will write you an original libretto based on it. And I was like, okay, now we're talking. And that was in like 2018. Um, so, you know, we just started kind of going back and forth about how you take this massive work, 5,000, almost 5,000 rhymed couplets, and turn it into an hour-long piece of music, right? Because words take longer to sing than they do to speak, right? So just, I mean, of course, if you sat there and read the book, it would take you however many years, um, but like if you were gonna sing it, I mean, just forever, we'd be here all day. So, um, so we kind of started looking at how to compress it, and she had already turned a version of it into a play, so she had some sort of structure. And then a lot of it was, you know, like, it's not just an adaptation and translation. A lot of it's like her own original sort of writing on the ideas and themes, or like kind of rewriting some of the stories so that they fit nicely in English. You know, but she has a very, she took years to go really deep into, into translating this work, so she understands it from the inside out. And if you haven't read her translation, I mean, it's like critically acclaimed. It's, I'm extremely lucky to get to work with this person. Um, they're selling it in the bookstore. <laughs> it's right on the display. So, you know, so, so we took this giant, epic work and we pared it down into a 20 page libretto, right, that that focused on a structure that worked musically and that still kind of echoed this idea of nested parables and told a through narrative that was compelling. And then my own process is, I mean, I'm a singer, so I, um, I usually just sing through it. You know, and in this piece, and, and a lot of the work that we do with the Resonance Collective in general is 
it's not just uh, a performance. It has uh, it has the essence of ritual to it, right? So I was in a um, I was in a frat in college, and um, and Greek fraternities are often based on the illusion Greek cults, like the Greek mystery cults, right? And their initiation rituals often tie to specific um, Greek mythologies. I won't tell you our deep secrets because I'm sworn to secrecy, but ours is based on Orphic mythology because it was a music fraternity, and um, you know and and. Uh, the initiation ritual, right, was this thing that really, it really grabbed me um, as at a young age. This idea that, like, of, of revelation and of, of, like, the initiation ritual being a thing that is in itself transformative, and then coming to realize that theater is sort of always that. And one of the things that when you have, like, a really large pledge class, um, one person will go through the initiation ritual as a proxy for everybody else. And I realized, oh, that's what theater is every single time. Right, is that we are following the characters through their journey and being able to experience it with them. And again, the Resonance Collective work that we built, this is our third such, um, we call them dance operas, is our third such dance opera, and all of them basically tell the same story. It's a story from ignorance to understanding. Like our first piece was about, um, was based on the major arcana of the Tarot. The second one was based on um, uh, the poem said Pierre Lunaire, and then there's this one. And they all follow that, that journey of ignorance to understanding, and the hope is that the audience will get a glimpse of that understanding at the end of the journey also. But not only the audience, one, one of the things that we're realizing through this piece is that the performers are getting to live it. So in some ways, the primary audience for this piece are the performers themselves. They are the birds that go on this journey and, and getting to talk to the performers, I mean, we've been working on this piece. I mean, there was a global pandemic that sort of made it difficult for a while. But, um, but we started workshopping in 2019, and we just did two workshop performances in March. Um, and, and it was only once we actually did the piece from beginning to end that the performers were like, oh, we get it. You know, like now we really understand the story. And I remember the second per workshop performance we were going to do was only going to be highlights. And, um, and the performers showed up that day and they were like, no, we're doing the whole thing. Mm. It was really interesting, you know, I mean, we, the director and I, we had this whole plan, it's like, oh, we're gonna do little snippets. Our dancer, our like, one big solo dancer had just gotten COVID, so she couldn't do the show. And we're like, we're just gonna do sections. And the performers were like, absolutely not. It, the story is a journey. We wanna go, go on this journey and we wanna share it with everybody else. It has to be complete. So we just, Okay, we restaged it without a dancer in three hours and put on the show. It was great. Um, so, but I think that's for me. That's like that's what these theatrical narratives are, right? Is that is that is the opportunity to go on that journey? And we always tell the same story. Always ignorance to understanding, ignorance to understanding. Thank you. Yes. Um, do you find it uh, difficult to sort of leave behind the collect? as you move into performance. Obviously there's a lot of thinking about what you're doing, about what you're doing, a lot of referencing, but it seems like the goal of the performance and music is to sort of get to the transcendent. So is it is it difficult to, to sort of leave one behind and let the other one show itself or reveal itself? Not if you practice. That's what practice is for, as a, I think as a musician, right? Is it's about getting through the technical and the intellectual so that that part becomes automatic. And then you're just in the story, and you're just living it, right? And you're being, in, and you're being hyper present. So now I'm not thinking like, okay, so that person's gonna come in, and that's my cue, and then I go this way. It's like, my lover just walked in the door, I have to go to them, <laughs> right? You know, and that's it. Then you're just in it, and you're, and you're living in it. At its best, that's what, that's I think what the performance practice is. Right, so same thing with, with improvisation. You practice your scales and your arpeggios and all these other kinds of things so that when the moment comes, it's, you just turn off your brain and it's just automatic. And you just Google flow state, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I'm uh, fascinated uh, with uh, the concept that you presented of uh, art uh, being able to elevate consciousness. And you also talked about uh, being able to express the ineffable 
And, you know, um, I mean, the hero's journey is cool. Uh, it's a story. Uh, but it would, seem, it would seem like maybe uh, there's something beyond just that, um, beyond just a story that could be evoked in the art. And, uh, and, and so I'm very interested in that. I'm also interested in uh, how you might see that being applied in contemporary uh, media. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, opera, you know, it's been around for a while. I guess it's, it's contemporary now that, you know, there's a lot of video projection and mm -hmm. stuff like that. But I'm, I'm just curious where you might. So, okay, so right. These are great, two, two great questions. And then I will um, show you a sample of the piece. So, um, so you get a flavor of what I'm talking about um, practically. But I think, <clears throat> da, 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 da. so you mentioned the hero's journey, which is often a journey from ignorance to understanding. The question is, what is the understanding? Right? And, um, and when we're talking about wanting to access those ineffable truths, I think that can be on the other side of that understanding. So, yes, the hero's journey is a thing, but what we're interested in is what's on the other side of that, of that journey. And these narratives walk very much through these prototypical hero's journey archetypes, the Seven Valleys, the Tarot, these kinds of things. But it can happen in a five minute piece of music or in a, a, a timeless painting, right? And to answer your second question, I, I, don't, I don't think that these things are related or confined to certain media. I think any media, what we were saying before, you can put a frame around anything. Duchamp put a frame around a urinal, right? And suddenly art, right? So, so the question is, what are we willing to put a frame around? How can we move beyond our, our moralizing and our judging about things? Is it good art? Is it bad art, right? And just saying like, not even is it art, right? Am I willing to make it art? Am I willing to elevate it to that realm of the sacred? Am I a, a willing to let it work its influence on me like that and to have my consciousness changed because of it? So to answer your question, I mean like, yeah, I mostly work in experimental and contemporary stuff you know um like i, I most of my performance practice the improvisation i was talking about <clears throat> is mostly voice and electronics i love working with video and i think all of that's there you know it's just a question of that like artists are just creating opportunities for people they're creating architecture people walk inside it and they fill the architecture with whatever they bring and maybe that architecture speaks to them maybe they they have the space that they need to finally fill it with whatever that they needed to, to move through that door. I don't know, I feel like my metaphors are getting really extended here. <laughs> you know, but I hope, I hope that helps a little bit. Um, I don't want to keep you here forever. I would love to have this conversation for all time, but I will share just a little bit about the show in case you want to come. We, uh, we're performing at the Broad Stage June 18th and 19th. Um, uh, uh, the, that's for the Conference of the Birds. I also wanted to share that if you're interested, the Residence Collective hosts a weekly, sorry, not weekly, well, not, uh, a monthly concert series that is explicitly about expanding and extending the inherent ritual and ceremony of the concert experience into one that's more akin to a religious experience. And that, that net that we throw is really wide. Uh, last month, in April, we had a Sufi concert, the Leon Ensemble performed. This month we did, it was all contemporary piano pieces, solo piano works, based on um, Buddhist ideas. In two weeks, on June 4th, we have a gamelan concert. Um, there's going to be a noise opera based on Filipino mythology. There's just like all kinds of, you know, it's all these different things of, again, us asking this question, what is sacred music? While knowing the answer, this too, this too is sacred. And, and about how we can kind of come into a space and frame that experience so that we can experience it as something that might elevate us just a little bit higher. So if you're interested, um, that information is on the Resonance Collective uh, webpage and, um, and the other stuff is about the, the Broad Stage. Um, if you're curious, I'm, I'm happy to share with you, I loaded up a, a sound sample from one of the movements of the Conference of the Birds. Yeah, Great. I will spend my last five minutes showing you this. It is the Valley of Wonderment, and it follows the same format as all the other valleys, which is there is a, uh, an introduction. The birds come in, they crest over the hill into the valley, and the hoopoe, the leader of 
the bird says, ah, yes, here's the valley of the quest, or the valley of wonderment, and explains something. And then the hoopoe is like, oh, and look, and inside that valley, we see something that epitomizes that valley, which is one of the stories that Natar put inside each of the valleys to illustrate what they are. So you'll get like a little, it's like a, the aria in a way, is the sort of story within the story. And then afterwards, um, with this particular valley, when we come out of that story, the hoopoe dispenses some wisdom. And then this sort of, uh, what the Sufis call sohbet happens, this sort of mystical conversation. I think it's, the singing is pretty clear, so you should be able to understand the words.
that's the teaser. You can come out and see the full thing in June. So uh, thank you very much for coming out. Thank you to Kelly and the PRS for having me. It's a real pleasure. I've been wanting to do this for a long time, and this is the perfect excuse. So um, yeah, stay in touch. Thank you. Thank you.